Okie dokie, let us try that all again. I do apologize for the technical difficulties that we seem to be experiencing at the start of each drive over the last few days, but we are back up and running once again thanks to the technical genius of one Mr. Alex Voz, who somehow manages to fix problems despite not being anywhere in South Africa or indeed anywhere near us. Now my name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Gert on camera with me and to go over everything once again we are a live safari the only place in the world where you can watch a live safari not only are we live we're also interactive which means send us through your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv and not just that, but we are coming to you from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. There we go, done and dusted. I think I've ticked all the boxes. Oh, and we've got Rebecca and Lou in final control. There we go. That's all sorted. Steph is out with Dave on camera with him and together we will be looking for all kinds of marvellous things to show you. I was on my way to Cheetah Plains, however, Things have changed. Things have changed completely because I've picked up very, very fresh male leopard tracks on one of the roads coming into this area. I suspect, and I mean, I, I don't for one second claim to be an expert in this. There are certain trackers that can identify individual animals by their tracks. I am not one of them. However, I feel as though the tracks might belong to Sundile. The young male leopard that we had at the end of the sunset safari yesterday. Now what that means and where that makes life a little bit tricky is he runs away. I discovered that yesterday where I accidentally bumped into him on foot and he raced away from me. He didn't go far but he did straight run away straight away. So I'm going to try and see if we can't find him from the vehicle. While we do that let's go across to Steph and see if he would like no and so that he can say a very good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon, good afternoon. And we are at Sydney's dam and have a look at this image of desolation and dryness. I must say I'm quite surprised that this dam has nothing at it. It's just ourselves. I'm Stefan and on camera today is Dave. And this is the Sunset Safari here. And we decided to come into this area this afternoon because we had word through our network of informants, basically, it's just the friendship circle of guides, that there's a female leopard of some description on her way down to this pan. And I must say, it looks like something has been through here today. I'm not quite sure exactly what. Because, to be honest, there shouldn't be such a lack of animals here unless there were some lions or there were some leopard or cheetah or some wild dog that have come barreling through here. Now, I did hear a report that some ahina den activity is on the other side of the dam wall, and that could be a good, um, that could definitely be a good uh, example of what would, what would chase away animals, I guess, if ahina were commonly around here. But as to exactly what is keeping things away from me, I don't know. But nevertheless, what we're going to do is we're going to work our way slowly outwards from this dam. We see if we can find something to show you. Or some sign of that female, female leopard that was in the area. Now, if Jamie hasn't already mentioned it, you're welcome to send us through some questions or any comments that you have. You can use the email questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag safari live on Twitter and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can throughout the safari and don't worry if you don't know if you don't know a question to ask us you can just make a comment we, we love your comments as much as what we love your questions It's quite a hot day today. It's about 86 degrees Fahrenheit here, about 30 degrees centigrade. And this is for us deep winter. We are about to start the swing of the season that will happen now in the next couple of weeks. I always mark the start of the swing of this particular season at being about the 1st of August because it's always been the 1st of August. 
traditionally my family have gone away on a bit of a holiday and I always notice coming back when we used to live on the high felt which is the central plateau of South Africa when we used to come up from the coast and make our way back onto the high felt I used to feel like I could take off my jerseys and my layers of jackets and then when I started to work here in the bush we realized that somewhere around about the middle of the month from the 10th to about the 15th of August all the trees start to flower, all the early blooming trees start to flower. Trees like knobthorns and shambok pods and weeping boar beans. And they're always fantastic things because they end up being these big lodestones for a bunch of different birds and insects. And those of course being some of my favorite pastimes looking for those insects. Alright, so no tracks come out on this particular road which is not too much of a problem. I didn't really expect her to come past the gate and all its noise, but it would have been nice if she was hanging around at that dam. But it is interesting to see that there's a very distinct lack of foot traffic. And that could be just because of the heat of the day. Animals are finding, much like they do on the Chobe River in Botswana, they find it less energy sapping to actually stand at or close to water or at or close to feeding areas during the heat of the day and then do the majority of their moving at night time and that could possibly be what we're starting to go in right now. I doubt it though, I think there's a bit of a mix of something going on over here to be honest with you. I don't think it's quite as simple as just an easy explanation. But there's definitely a definitive lack of footprints going towards the dam and back at least from the Juma side of our traverse. It is a wonderful afternoon though. Starting to get these washed out, this washed out dustiness that is so typical of the last little bit of the dry season. You can see all around us here, it's almost a pale look to everything. There's a paleness to the sky. It's not that deep blue. There's a paleness to the dust on the leaves and the trees. Everything's turning this sort of hazy grayish blue color. And that'll get more pronounced as we start to approach October. With October lovingly known out here as Hell Month because of the devilishly hot temperatures that we have, the complete lack of any sort of vegetation or any sort of water, and just animals in general just looking not their best. Except for lions, of course. Lions and leopard and cheetah and wild dog, they look their absolute best during October. Nice and full and round. All right, we're we going to be going down the road over here. I'm busy scanning the game paths that crisscross this road from this drainage basin to this drainage basin and of course Sydney's dam. And hopefully we pick up something interesting to show you. In the meantime, I do know that Jamie's got an update for you. At the moment, we are walking at a snail's pace. I'm trying to decide exactly what it is we should do in this situation because apparently we've just got word that there are alarm calls outside our camp that we live at. Here's the last set of tracks I had for him and just bear with me one moment I want to get out and just have a look. First of all at the tracks themselves and secondly I just have a feeling that he might be around here. I don't I can't quite decide whether I want to try and follow up on these tracks because they look so fresh or whether I want to go racing across to what we call the DRC to see whether or not he pops out here. So these are the tracks themselves. Lovely leopard tracks, beautifully clear and on a road that Steph drove down three times this morning. So definitely on top of the vehicle tracks apart from underneath being underneath mine because I drove on top of them initially. So this is the leopard track that we are talking about with its three lobes at the back and his toes, beautiful, there's nothing more perfect than a leopard track. Now if you compare them to the size of my hand, oh, perhaps, no, am I wrong about it being Sindile? Because now that I'm up close and personal, I'm just wondering whether or not there's a possibility that it's Karula that has come back. No, no, I'm not wrong. These are not Karula's tracks. 
They're not small enough, I don't think. Hmm. Crippling self-doubt. No, they're not. They're not Karula's tracks. No, I want to just have a. I want to just get out quickly and check where they've gone from here. Unfortunately, I only spotted them when I drove through this area a little bit too late. So I, st I drove on top of some of them, and I did want to just check. I actually went, wanted to go for a little bit of a walk along the road and just figure out exactly where it is they've gone. I'm going to mark them as the last set of tracks that I saw for whoever else comes along. I think we better go check out those alarm calls though first. But it's not Karula. It is most definitely a young male. While I just go and double check along here, it's just a short walk in. Let's go back to Steph and find out how he's doing. You just get come back to us as we spot one absolutely gigantic kudu. It is one of the largest antelope that we have here in the bush, and he is a prime example of that large antelope. This is, this is the greater kudu, <clears throat> and he's quite easily the largest of the antelope we find here, sharing the top spot with wildebeest and waterbuck. They all weigh around about the same, around about 500 pounds. Only this is a this is a really big example of one, and I'm I'm making that judgment based on two things: well, the bulk of his actual body, which is quite difficult for you to see in the picture right now because it's obscured by the leaves, but and then also by his horns. Old kudu like this have very deep corkscrews, and if you have a look carefully at the tips of his horns, the last say hand two or three inches you'll notice that they are busy with their third turn and the horn points are actually pointing away from one another. This is now an old male kudu. Past his prime, he wouldn't be able to compete effectively against the younger, stronger kudu bulls, but it doesn't take away from the majesty of this particular animal. He's really, really such a pleasure to see. Usually around about this time, they've become lion food and in areas where Hunting is prevalent. Quite often, old male kudu like this end up on someone's wall. As sad as what that is. I'm just so happy that we don't have any hunting around here. And he seems to be wily enough to have evaded lions. He'd probably be around about 10 years old. And just have a look at him there. Kudu have a very wide diet of leaves and branches and twigs. Next to the elephant and the white rhino, oh, uh, yeah, next to the elephant, they are, the, they eat the most diverse species of plant. They eat about 150 different plants, uh, different species of plants, and only elephant eat more, eat more species than what they do. Wow, what a pleasure. Generally, these guys are actually attended by some younger kudu. And I have no doubt that if we have a look around here, we probably will find that there will be one or two other kudu with him. There he looks at us through the bush. Those huge trumpet-shaped ears catching every sound. He can move those trumpets. You can see he's keeping an ear on us even now. He's moving off into some thicker bush. See if we can get a little bit of a better view of him. I doubt the bush is going to afford us. Looks like we've just got a gap. Oh, no, moving through the bush. Wouldn't think with it being so dry that it would actually be this thick, but it is. See if we can go forward a little bit. Ah, and I even see another kudu. So, the prediction about there being two or three is come, come right. Let's see if I can show you. And he should be a younger kudu. There he is. Yeah, you can definitely see, he, although large, that's the big one that we've just been looking at. And if you pan right, the other one is there. You can just see his horn. It looks like a branch. 
on the on the right hand side of your screen in that gap there we go that's actually a kudu's horn believe it or not and you can see that that corkscrew is definitely not as deep as the other one was difficult to contrast them now although this particular kudu has got a much wider horn spread there he walks the other guy around the back <laughs> We've actually been so lucky seeing both a youngster and an old guy like this. These youngsters are called Ascaris. And the only other animal that I know of that displays a similar tendency for these old, massive animals to be accompanied by the younger ones are elephant. Have a look at that. Now you can see that that twist in that particular horn is actually quite shallow. I would say that this kudu is no more than five years old and still has much growing to do. And look, to be honest with you, horn length and, th and, 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 uh, and the twist in the horn and how they are spread has got a lot more to do with genetics than age. You sometimes find kudu with very widely spread horns, with very tight horns like that kudu we've just seen. Deep curls, not so deep curls. End of the day, I suppose it's just a hairdo. And Brooklyn, who's only 10 years old. Hello, Brooklyn. You've asked me a question now. Interesting question is like, how long do kudu's horns get? And <clears throat> and um, and don't they snag on bushes and branches? Now, Declan, I do know that a really big kudu's horn is around about 50, five zero inches, with the world record horn at around about 62 to 66 inches, somewhere in that, that gap. So that's pretty long horn, measured along the ridge all the way to the top. So 62 or so inches um, of horn is the longest that they get. And they don't snag them on bushes because they can actually, if you take the kudu's body here with his nose through there, they can actually put their horns flat along their back and still keeping their nose straight, walk through the bushes and then they lift their horns up after the bushes. So they go through the bushes or they jump over the bushes and that's the way that they, uh, that they move through the bushes. But they do hit their horns on branches quite a lot. They're, not, they're absolutely not as mobile through the bush as something with smaller horns or, um, or a female for that matter of fact. I've got an interesting folklore story, a very dear friend of mine, a tracker, my very first tracker that I worked with. And, uh, one of the five best men I've ever met on this planet, Richard Nduban, told me a story that uh, he was told that Kudu was punished for his vanity. Kudu used to admire himself in the mirror all the time for his big muscles and the way that he stood higher than all the other antelope and his coat with the beautiful stripes and the dots on it. And uh, he was punished for his vanity by given a choice of horns. And he could have chosen small pointy horns, he could have chosen straighter horns, he could have chosen horns of any length. But Kudu, because of his vanity, went straight to the most majestic of all the horns. He picked the spiral long horn, the 60 inch horn, and put that on his head. And therefore he was cursed for his vanity forever onwards. And getting snagged in bushes, and getting caught up in branches, making him a bit slower. And obviously then easier for lions to catch. And that's what Richard used to believe solely, that Kudu was vain, and he didn't hold Kudu in high regard at all. Considered them actually quite close to just general food rather than pretty things <laughs> to admire like we do. I think let's carry on, if, unless we get another view of that. There he is. Sorry, Dave. This is one of these opportunities that... Uh, that you can't miss out. It's like seeing an elephant with massive tusks or seeing a lion with a big, big mane. You have to appreciate these little wonders when we get them. Now you can see his hips over there are starting to stick out and that's a sign not only of, of uh, a bit of malnutrition, but also of the fact that he, but yeah, he, I'm looking through my binoculars now at him. And he is a beautiful guy. A little bit skinny. You can see those hips and his spine starting to stick out. But you can see the back of his neck. All the exercise of those horns. Every now and again when he sticks it up, you'll see the width of that neck. And you'll be able to look down the horns. Now, what's quite funny 
is that, and this is still on Brooklyn's question, is that a kudu can actually see the tip of his horn. It doesn't look possible. But a kudu can look up, if you look up into the corner of your eye, the top corner, all we can see is our eyebrow, or I can only see my eyebrow, but a kudu can actually see the tip of his horn. If you put your eye on the tip of his horn, you look down the corkscrew of a, of, of a kudu's horn, you can see his eyeball and his iris, which means that he can see you. And they use their horns not only in fighting and displaying, but they use their horns to hook branches and to break branches that are a little bit too high for their mouths to reach. And so they do serve some function, and not just to hamper his movements. Now that is very typical of a kudu, standing in the open bush, in, in the open bush, standing camouflaged, hardly even see him. I mean, there's literally only one bush between us and that kudu, and he's still quite camouflaged. Now, I know Jamie has just gotten back to her car, and she has been tracking that young male leopard, um, and she probably has an update for you or some news on what's been going on. We'll catch up with you in a little bit. My update is that he is almost certainly in this river system or drainage line here. Now I'm trying to be really careful because I don't want to scare him at all. So I don't want to walk too far into this particular patch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow an old off-road track that leads into this drainage system and see if he's not here somewhere in the shade. He's certainly going to be in the shade. That we know for certain. His tracks came straight to this Tambuti tree. So everybody keep your eyes peeled as we drive through here, through this river system. Because those tracks are so, so fresh. Hiding under a bush perhaps, or up in a tree. These are all perfect. This is a perfect hiding hole for a leopard like Sindile. Oh, oh. We're about to get ourselves stuck. That would not be fun. That's not good. What, why are we doing this? There we go. That was a bit odd. But it's okay, we're up the other side. I don't think I would live it down if I got stuck in here. Alright, his tracks came straight through here. Otherwise, what we'll go and do is we'll go and check around quarantine in that area. Hello, boy, are you here somewhere? Hiding in the shade. Perhaps on a termite mound. Perhaps under a tambuti tree. Lots of perfect tidy holes for a leopard to be sleeping under. There's one small thing that concerns me a little bit is while I was tracking I remembered that Steph said that Karula's cub tracks were around Philemon's dip but hopefully Karula being Karula has stashed them somewhere very secret and very safe in a very good place. I hope you're all keeping an eye out under every bush for the flash of a white tail because that's usually what it gives away a sleeping leopard. So while I concentrate on searching for him down here, let's go back across to Steph, who has got a member of the port of the pig family. And something that's quite rare on game drives is seeing these warthogs without them running away. And here we have a sounder of warthog with two adult females and what looks like two babies, well, one baby each, that there's a pair of babies and a pair of adults. And quite often you find successive generations of moms with warthogs all hanging around together. So the one that you have got in the center of the screen there now, that's the oldest one. <clears throat> the next adult will be one of her litter. And then she may have one of the babies and her daughter may have one of the babies. And they'd be utilizing this little bit of grass left in the shade of this particular tree. Warthog really battle in the drought like we've got at the moment, although I must be honest, this warthog looks in prime condition. Her 
buttocks are quite nice and round. There where the tail comes out, a skinny warthog gets a sharp edge there and she hasn't got a sharp edge there whatsoever. I know at my house in Hootsbreit, that's where I live, my wife is feeding some warthogs with hail bays at the, uh, and the, at the moment and I know some of the warthogs that visit her feeding station have become incredibly skinny. This one doesn't look skinny at all, which is good. Testimony that she knows what to do. She knows how to save energy and how to make it. Warthog are grass eaters and generally eat the rhizomes of grass. So generally eat where the grass comes from and utilize their nose. They've got a cartilaginous disc in their nose and they can pick up the rhizome with their disc. It's almost like having a fingernail at the end of your nose. And they pick up the grass and they eat it. Here she's looking. I know it's a female. Have a look closely at the face. You may be able to see, you might have to walk up to the screen. We've run out of zoom on this particular camera. And you'll notice that under the eyes is a pair of warts where they get their names from. And then just at the back of her tusks, there should be another pair of warts if it's a male. She only has a pair of warts under her eyes. And that's how we tell if it's a male or female from a distance is having a look at those warts. Now, of course, immortalized in the, in the play, The Lion King, this is Pumba. Bring it forward a little bit. And Pumba had a love of everything. Abhishek have asked me, has asked me if warthog hunt other animals. Abhishek, no, they don't, except I have seen them eat carrion. So it's not uncommon for warthogs to arrive at a kill and to start feeding on, on carrion. They don't kill it themselves. It's almost always dead first. And, uh, and they definitely will not shy away, especially in dry times like this. They won't shy away from eating meat. And the reason for that is that certain minerals you can only get from meat, certain amino acids you can only get from meat. And pigs in general have got quite an omnivorous diet. They will eat meat when they can. They will eat insects when they can. Generally though, and I would say here, above 80% of her diet is made up of grass and grass rhizomes. I've got a very interesting habit. For those of you who don't know, warthog live in disused ant bear holes in the side of termite mounds. And they will quite often excavate in additional areas onto their termite mounds. And they do that because they reverse basically into their holes. They go in backwards so that their tusks always point outward. Did you find that interesting? And they can then shoot out of their holes, tusks first, at the first sign of danger. Using that very thick, strong neck that they have there to inflict some terrible wounds. They're just having some fun. She's standing in the shade. That's a very clever thing to do. On an afternoon like this afternoon, which is in the mid-80s in terms of Fahrenheit, you definitely don't want to be standing in the sun and using any of your pressured water reserves. Ah. And MMG has just asked me, would a mother warthog defend her piglets? Would she run at lions or leopards the same as what, uh, as what buffalo do? Absolutely, MMG. I have this wonderful memory of a story about cheetah. And a mother cheetah, she had three babies and she was very hungry. And I watched her stalk these warthogs for about an hour. And she eventually ran after this mother warthog and caught one of her piglets. And this mother warthog came like a steam train across this open area and bashed the cheetah in the side, knocking the cheetah off of the baby warthog and thus saving her baby warthog. And they all went squeaking off into the bush, leaving this cheetah incredibly bewildered as to what just happened. Um, but they're absolutely not shy of attacking, of attacking larger predators. I've watched warthog attack lioness. I've watched them attack leopard, both male and female. 
generally they come off second best with male water with male uh, with male leopard and with lion but with female leopard and sometimes with young leopard wild dogs and cheetah the warthog definitely isn't at a, too much of a disadvantage now there is some movement in the back there it looks like those kudu there we go it's a female kudu she's just stepping out and that would also answer why we had that giant corkscrewed male here yeah, it's got he's got some females around have a look at how cheeky that warthog is obviously doesn't want to share her grass with the with the kudu <laughs> i suppose when there's only a certain amount of grass left you do what you can little does that warthog know that the kudu doesn't eat grass at all So Mary Edwards have just, has just obviously observed that that kudu has a ridge of hair on their back. Now Mary, it's because kudu use that hair to break their profile, so it's a, it serves two roles. One is a camouflage, uh, camouflage function in that they can erect a crest of hair along their back and that breaks their profile, making them a little bit more invisible. But secondly, male kudu use it as an intimidating factor to other kudu. They'll erect that crest of hair and then stand side on with one another and it just makes them their profile look that much more impressive. The light is diffused through that crest and they just look bigger and healthier and more robust. And that is what female kudu like to see apparently or, and what intimidates other kudu. Females, they just have that tiny crest along the back there. Type of mane I suppose, similar to our horse would have. Once again, just breaks that profile. And when they're standing with bushes behind them, a very, very effective camouflage technique. You can almost see her head almost disappears entirely behind that bush, even though that bush isn't really thickly leaved at all. There's a baby kudu there as well. Saturday Ocean have just asked me if we get eland and Gemsbok here in the Kruger National Park. Um, Saturday Ocean, we do get eland in the Kruger National Park. There's been one or two records of it in the Sabi Sands. However, I've never seen an eland in the Sabi Sands myself. Gemsbok or Oryx, we do not get in this part of the country. We start getting them from the central areas up into the western areas of the country where they are dry land specialists. You find a lot of them in the drier parts of the country. Hey, there's a red-headed weaver here, he's back. Can I just steal you for one second off of the kudu before he flies away? In the top of this tree, we've got a few birds, there we go. And there, go up a little bit, that's a helmet shark, up a little bit, there we go, into that on the right-hand side. Uh, right in the center of the screen at the top is a red-headed weaver. You might just see every now and again this red flash now, the birds you're seeing moving inside there are helmet shrikes. The red-headed weavers are a bird we don't see too often. You can just see his head sticking out the top of the bush. He's now flown away. <laughs> but anyway, confirmed sighting of a red-headed weaver. And there we have the helmet shrikes or the white helmet shrikes that are left in the tree. All right, now back to the warthogs. Sorry. For those of you keeping your bird lists out there, it's been many months since we last saw a red-headed weaver. You can go and look through your bird lists at the dates. And that means that the seasons are imminently changing. They start to make their nests in the beginning of August and is one of the first of the weavers to start building their nests. It's another indicator that the seasons are about to change. The fact that we're seeing these red-headed weavers around. Oh, there's many more than just two babies. Jen Ward has just asked me if the summer trees that I was talking about a couple of minutes ago, that flower around about now, if they will still flower in the drought. Jen, that's a very, very good question. Um, 
I actually can't answer that. They will flower. They might just not flower at the time that I, I predicted them to flower. It's going to be interesting to see how deep into August we get um, with these flowering trees. I have no idea. I saw in 1998 when I started to guide in the park we were heading into a wet year and there the tree started flowering on the 10th of August I remember quite vividly seeing my first knobthorn flower on the 10th of August 1998 and ever since then they've been sort of between the 10th of August and the 15th of August where I've seen my first flowers my first knob my first knobthorns flowering last year it probably was around about the 15th of August, the 17th of August, where we saw our knobthorns flowering. But I have absolutely no idea. I, I don't know how these trees cope with drought. It's going to be an interesting thing for me to see, uh, as well as you, I suppose. But definitely mark it in your diary and check in again on the 10th to the 15th. On that note... Let's send you back over to Jamie, who's got an update on her leopard tracking escapade. I found a leopard. Orchid. Um, ha ha. It's the joke that VM always plays on us. Whenever we drive around a corner, VM goes, Leopard! Orchid. And that is the plant that is sitting there on top of the overhanging branch, looking down at us, a parasitic plant that taps into the root system of trees and anchors itself there or not in the root system, sorry, into the bark system of a tree and anchors itself there and grows the most amazing flowers. Unfortunately, that is the one and only update that I have for you. This is in fact called a leopard orchid. Uh, James, of course, was famous for... What, was he, what did he have to do? He had to take a shoot and plant it elsewhere and it said something to do with having luck with ladies or something. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was that James was doing. But he promptly nearly fell out of a tree doing it. Where he managed to climb all the way up into a dead leadwood. And then he plucked a part of it. I'm not sure, you guys will have to remind me exactly what it was that James was up to and why he was attempting to transplant a leopard orchid from one place to another. No, no leopard orchid. I mean, leopard orchid, no leopard. I keep thinking he's just here somewhere. My only conclusion is that I must have missed his tracks crossing somewhere just in front of me. Because at this point I think with the we could have seen we should have seen him moving through this area. I even did a little walk, promptly scared a scrub hare that was right next to my feet. It was hiding in a bush right next to my feet. It exploded out and ran away, at which point my adrenaline levels and heart rate skyrocketed. They went through the roof. But we're all okay. Everything's fine. We're all in one piece. There's nothing like a surprise animal. 95% of the, the scares or the frights that I've had while I've been on foot have been thanks to something small and harmless. Whether it be a Franklin or a Corhan or a scrub hare, warthog, big one. They are the ones that usually and I'm sure Steph can attest to that as well. They're, they're responsible for most of one's heart-stopping moments out here in the African bush. Just something that stays still, is so used to staying still that they only move when you're right next to them. And with that rustle of trees, your brain goes into hyperdrive, trying to figure out what it should do next, what it is, trying to analyze every single, um, every single issue that you're going to have to potentially deal with all the while fighting that impulse that your feet have which is to take several steps back which of course this is very very important that one doesn't do in a real dangerous situation very important not to go running anywhere sometimes easier said than done okay I think I must have missed his tracks here because I can't, I can't see him, and he must have been somewhere close. And his tracks are very, very fresh, and they were heading in this direction. Unless he crossed here, it'd be next to impossible for me to see without spending a considerable period of time doing it. So we'll have to just do a loop of the area and keep trying, because I want to know now 
whether or not I'm correct about it being Sindile. That would be, that's to me one of the most interesting aspects is where he's, the way in which he's moving and the, mo the, tr the traveling that he's doing is all so fascinating because it reveals so much in terms of interesting information since Sindilo has been in captivity for eight months. He's now been released into the wild. He's a young male and therefore his story, everything that he does becomes that much more educational in a way because you l we're learning something a little bit about the way that he works. Now, I do need to just hop onto the Game Drive channel. I want to let Tax know about this because one thing he could do is possibly put fan on them. Ah, he's going to disappear to the north. Okay, so last tracks, one last double check. The last tracks I had for our young Sindile. It was roughly around here that the scrub hair came bursting out and into my life in a very explosive fashion. And the last tracks I had were here, heading straight in there. It's not possible. I must have missed his tracks somewhere. There's no way we can't, we wouldn't have seen him. Absolutely no way. Must have missed them somewhere. Okay, let us expand the search further afield. Tax, tax. Afternoon tax. I think this is Nkonzo for that young Madoda. It looks like he's gone into the drainage around Philemon's dip, Rebecca's area. I've been trying to follow up, no luck so far, but yesterday I noticed he's very skittish on foot. No problem, enjoy your afternoon. Okay, he didn't come through here. I would have seen them. I'm sure of it. So he hasn't come through here. Did he skip across the road somewhere? I think I mentioned this a couple of afternoons ago. That sometimes tracking leopards is like building a jigsaw puzzle. Where you don't have all of the side pieces and you're not entirely sure what the the complete picture looks like. You've got a vague idea, but not completely. It's like you've lost the cover picture or the cover of the box. And you're trying to piece together exactly what they've been up to and where they've gone. Because he's walked all the way along Philemon's dip here. Why? Where did he come from? Steph had his tracks further to the north there. It all gets very, very confusing trying to figure this out. Perhaps hiding in the shade. Did we drive past him on our way through here? I hope not. I'd be very embarrassed. But anything's possible. I'll stop to double check. These perfect hiding spots for leopards make, in turn, finding them. You got tracks there. Aha! Yeah. Uh -huh. Let me just see what Hart has got, and then I will be able to answer Mark Kim's question about the way in which predators die. So, actually, I'm actually going to do it while I hop out of the vehicle and just have a look. So, Mark Kim was wondering when predators get old. How is it that, what is their actual cause of death? Is it starvation? Is it something similar? Sorry, you're losing my mic. I'm standing between, put the car between us and them. All right, so most predators, and this, these are his tracks, by the way, well done that, coming along up Philemon's dip, which is a very good start. It means we're on to something. 
a mark most of them it will be they become weakened by hunger because they can no longer catch their own food and because they become weakened and because they're older they start to slow down and then almost inevitably they are killed by one of the other predators but it depends on which predator we are talking about so male lions for example they they may be not they may not even get to that stage since so much of a male lion's life is based around serious competition I'm just going to do a quick loop through here since Karula's cubs tracks head in this direction let's just have a look around keep a close eye on what's happening in this area now, a male lion is most likely going to be killed by another male lion an old lioness is most likely to be killed in a probably in an injury related to hunting because as her reflexes get slower the whole process of hunting becomes more dangerous female leopards probably be killed by lions or hyenas uh, and male leopards actually because their reflexes get slower as I said they get hungry their teeth get blunted so they really struggle to hunt and to kill and for yeah that that basically applies for the rest of the predators predators as well hyenas their most likely cause of death is going to be a male lion again because reactions get slower so those are the sorts of things that those are the sorts of threats that will face an aging animal almost inevitably their death is caused by interaction with another predator rather than actually starving to death and then sometimes what also happens because bear in mind a enormous number of the animals out here are carriers of tuberculosis so that will be another cause of death amongst them because as soon as the animal starts to get old as you know for any mammal as they get older their immune systems get weaker so the the tuberculosis that might have been not might have been present their whole lives but not affecting them when they were young and robust the tuberculosis might have kicked in and started to weaken them as well and in and parasites once an animal starts to lose condition those parasites really do take hold and cause an acceleration in that weakening effect and so far I found one scrub hare and one camera shy squirrel that wants to hop away oh no it's gone never mind oh dear not as successful as I thought it was going to be perhaps Gert, it is time for us to go to Jita Plains as we planned originally perhaps I should have stuck to my original instincts Now uh, speaking of disease resistance, Bethany has read that cats have antibiotic properties in their saliva which may help to heal injuries that they have acquired through that process where they lick the injury constantly. And you're wondering whether or not it applies to our carnivores and herbivores in this area. Um, I think that the negative bacteria in a lion or a leopard's mouth, I, I would say do more harm than good the other thing that animals often do you know how you have to put your domestic cats or dogs in a cone whenever they have an operation because otherwise they worry at the injury they lick it and they break open stitches and they actually s s retard the healing process the same applies to the leopards and the lions and whatever else happens to injure itself out here if they can lick it they do and that in turn could actually potentially slow down its healing rather than speed it up but there's a toss up there because apart from that and probably apart from a little bit of pain relief that it provides for them it also especially if it's an injury on the foot as they walk they're going to be picking up dirt almost constantly so that's another aspect to consider that perhaps it would be better it would be better to keep the dirt out but I know that if you find yourself ever handling a lion you really really 
don't really want to come into contact with the saliva with bare hands or with any open cuts or injuries because they are just so bacteria and parasite ridden and leopards and hyenas and all of the, the carnivores out here I'm not sure about our herbivores and whether or not they have I mean all saliva has a little bit of antibiotic property in it even our own but I'm not sure it would be sufficient to combat a major infection out here the amazing thing about these animals is that they do combat infection in fact they hardly ever get infected which I always find incredible because you see animals with injuries that look like if it were if it were the equivalent on a human being a human being would be dead and yet somehow these amazing creatures out here manage to heal themselves very very well And speaking of what lions mouths are like obviously they have a an interesting diet and they are not adverse to munching on several day old carcasses that have started to go green and rotten and smelly and Fiona you were wondering about whether or not lions will practice cannibalism and eat another de a dead pride member generally no so especially for the females that is very much unlikely unless they are absolutely starving so if a pride member has died in a situation where the pride is starved then yes they might be they might end up eating it male lions are slightly different in situations where they have killed an opponent another another potential uh, enemy in terms of co other, an opposing coalition if they've killed them they often eat them listening to the updates on the game drive channel sorry um, there are lots of recorded cases of lions male lions eating the bodies of those that they have defeated and we even had the situation where the Birmingham boys killed an Nkuhuma lioness and fed off her slightly apparently I mean the rumor goes I never ever saw this myself but the rumor is the famous Mapohos apparently mr. mr. T was quite famous for infamous for eating those lions that he killed and I also think there was a great deal of sensationalism surrounding Mr. T and Kinky Tail and the Mapohos in general just because there were so many of them that they well that they had such an enormous territory and therefore that they caused as much chaos as they did I don't there were some I heard some reports of people calling Mr. T positively evil which of course he wasn't he was just a male lion doing male lion things hyenas on the other hand have no compunction about eating their other clan members they will feed off pretty much anything leopards as well okay I'm going to leave this spot for now. I'll probably follow up as it starts to get a little bit darker. I've had no luck in terms of figuring out where these tracks have gone. So I'm going to move on and while I do, let's head back over to Steph and find out what his plans are. Yes, we've been, once again, we returned to uh, Sydney's dam so that we could have a look and see if fortunes have changed a little bit to see if anything is on the way back and I must be honest with you that nothing much has changed there was just two <laughs> impala that were standing that were standing there looking all forlorn and I just have I have a feeling that something is here it's just something in my intuition telling me that a dam like this should be it should have a procession of animals coming through it and not be so quiet there must be something here and equally I know dams in the Sabi Sands around this time of the year have these sort of resident lions or leopard that hang around them. And I'm wondering if there isn't a lion or a leopard perhaps around Sydney's. And we're very slowly scouring the bush around this particular area to see if we can find any sign. And there were some tracks of some lions going into the bush on this side uh, from probably early last night. And since they weren't found on safari this morning, I can only imagine either they were tracked off of the traverse sometime when I wasn't listening to my radio, or 
they're still lying inside here and it's their scent blowing onto the pan that's keeping the animals away. So we're just slowly sort of pickling our way through the bush over here, trying to see if we can pick up any other fresh sign. Right now, literally just tracks going into this block and that's about that, but not even an impala. Nevertheless, I hear Jamie's been having some fun trying to decipher the undecipherable leopard tracks. We definitely, on days like this, miss or Brent Leo Smith's enthusiasm at following tracks and his skilled intuition that he has. That man definitely has a sixth sense as to where to find these animals, I tell you. You'd be happy to know that my flu is progressing slowly through its final stages. My nose feels like I've had a live coal inserted up to each one of them and is burning probably bright red even as you're looking at it now through your lens. <laughs> and my na the nasally nature of my droning voice hopefully isn't putting too many of you to sleep. But we'll get over it. The nice thing out here is because it's so dry we tend to get over colds and flus relatively easy. We all have a healthy lifestyle out here, most of us do anyway. There's not, uh, nothing much here is given to excess, definitely. Not much to do out here, except healthy stuff. All right, so now what I'm looking for is those lion tracks, they came, they, they, they now we're heading into this block off onto our left hand side. And what I'm trying to make, or what I'm trying to make sense of here is if these tracks come out of this block or not and luckily for us this particular road has a lot of sand on it and, a and it will allow us to see relatively easily i'm hoping for where those lions cross out and if they don't cross out on here it'll give me the i think what i'll do is take a quick walk in here and see if we don't find them lying up in some shade somewhere but the clever thing to do or the wise thing to do is to first check the perimeters make sure that they didn't cross anywhere otherwise you could spend hours looking for something that has been found somewhere else usually in a different time zone to where you're looking at the moment embarrassingly so opening you up to much ridicule when you get back around the campfire at night time <laughs> But Kathy, you've asked if while well, we have a look at these impala, it gives us a gives us an opportunity to switch off and listen to the bush around us. Kathy, you asked me if the guides and trackers or us and the uh, and the cameramen have any protection. Uh, Kathy, no, we don't have any protection in the car. We don't carry firearms. They'd be ineffectual, mainly because the firearms that you need to kill the animals of the size that they are out here are so overpowered for use in a vehicle we'll end up doing more damage to ourselves and equipment trying to wield these massive high energy energy things and carrying knives and spears um, toothpicks against the giant you know he's not going to do much with a knife or a spear so we trust ourselves we trust the fact that we um, know how to read these animal behaviors we know when we're getting or crossing a line and number one rule out here is animals first you respect the animals first they have right of way this is their place you respect the fact that if an animal looks upset with you or looks like you know showing their teeth growling agitated trying to get away from you the whole time if an animal is displaying those types of displays at you it's absolutely time to make some space or even move away um, and that's what keeps us safe, is our behavior, uh, more so than uh, being able to get out of a sticky situation. Um, I hope that answered your question. It's probably not what my mother was wanting to hear me say this afternoon. She's wanting to know that I've got a bulletproof vest on and probably a cuirass that can come up and cover all my vitals in my neck in case of a marauding lion. But I can literally count on my one hand the amount of dangerous encounters I've had uh, incredibly dangerous, life-threatening encounters I've had um, in all the years and all the thousands and thousands of animal sightings that I have had, uh, both on foot and in the vehicle. The amount of really dangerous ones you can count 
literally on your one hand. So we are starting to see a few more animals here. There's another herd of kudu. Not the same one that we were following. We've just had a herd of impala right next to the car. Now we have these beautiful, look at that camouflage, hey? That striped skin looking like the dry sticks. And that ridge of fur breaking their outline there. Literally you only see her because of the moving of her lips. Nibbling at the bushes and the grass around us. Got some more kudu coming into the picture from the right hand side. They'll be in your picture in a little bit. These herds of kudu, you find females together almost all the time. I have very rarely ever, if ever, actually seen a female kudu on her own. Normally always together in a herd. And that's because more eyes and more ears make the job of finding and detecting predators that much easier. Now because we've got lion tracks in this area, I make a mental note of where these animals are, where they're moving. A couple of minutes from now, probably in about an hour or so, the sun will have set and the temperature would have cooled down sufficiently for these predators to start moving and becoming active. And that's when having marked where these kudu are and where the impala are is always a good thing. If they see or smell these predators, they'll give it a very distinctive, loud bark. Sounds like a bark. And we can use that then to try and locate whatever's there. There's a youngster that you're looking at in the center of the screen. I don't quite know what sex it is just yet because their horn buds wouldn't have grown, but they would have been born in around about March, right at the end of the wet season. The mothers would all be pregnant now. The rut is in May, so the ladies have their babies in March, April. They are ovulating again in about April, May. The rut occurs. Males are in attendance with these herds when they're at their strongest at the end of the wet season and then these females are pregnant again through the dry season when their fetuses are quite small and then into the wet season where the growth of their little babies generally just one calf at a time accelerates to a point where they need to have all the vegetation that summer produces for them and so they give birth at the end of summer and that would have been this year's crop of youngsters for this particular herd of kudu. Can't see much there. Let's see if we can go forward a little bit. Hang on. That one kudu coming into frame there. There literally is only five or six sticks between us and them. A camouflage working very well and what you're looking at there is the prime weight or the prime size of prey for lion. Lion specialize in prey that weigh between 100 pounds and about 500 pounds and this female kudu she weighs in a region of about 120 kilograms so about 250 pounds and a big male kudu about 500 pounds. Slap bang in the middle of what lion love to hunt and they're very good at hunting kudu Kudu being relatively slow moving when they run through the bush, they can jump high. Kudu, they have the ability to jump over bushes, lion have to run around, and that's how they get away. So, kudu, rather than be fast, have got this amazing ability to leap. So they'll bound through the bush and leap over trees and over bushes that lions would have to go around or through to get through. Now, I know it sounds like they can do it, but lions, I think, at the moment, in this particular time frame in this, in this arms race, lions definitely have the upper hand in that their numbers can block off potential escape routes. And usually when they hunt um, kudu, it will be successful a lot more than when they hunt, say, zebra or wildebeest, which are more on the open plains. Kudu, they tend to... 
they tend to enjoy quite a lot on the meal. I think let's carry on going. We carry on doing what we intended to do, and that is to circle this block and look to see if those footprints of those lions come out of this block. Oh. Let's see what this is. We've got tracks of a leopard here. I don't quite know what it is. But you can have a look right there. Let's see if I can show you. Uh, just before the big patch. There we go. Well done, Dave. That is a track of a leopard from last night. Looks to be a young male. I'm not going to say that it's in Dile, I'm not going to say that it's not another young male or incredibly large female. Very tough to say. Tracks have actually been blown on and uh, difficult to actually see what it is. But anyway, we're going to carry on having a look to see if these lions cross out of this particular block. Jamie's just got to Twin Dams and before she heads off to Cheetah Plains, I'm sure she'd like to tell you what she's up to. Oh, well, Steph finds out where those tracks are going. I've left the area for now and I'm going back towards the southern boundary just to see if there's any sign of the lovely Queen of Juma coming back onto Juma once again. Oh, this morning we had a very, very brief sighting of her. She was clearly hunting and she moved south into Little Gowry. It's a property that is south of our Traverse area. We are not allowed to drive there, so we couldn't stay with her and follow her but we know that she crossed alone she didn't take her two five-month-old cubs with her and that means at some point she's going to have to come back and fetch them so what leopards do is they put their cubs they hide their cubs somewhere safe usually with a couple of nice big trees that the little ones can flee to if they encounter a problem while mom is away and then she will head off and hunt without them and that, I mean, makes complete sense because although their instincts are there, their skill is not. And a little cub is very likely to risk the chances of a successful hunt. We saw it with the lion cubs just two days ago when they were hunting buffalo. And the three little cubs were so disinterested in, well, no, they were, they were interested in what their parent and their mother and aunt were doing. But at the same time, they were also far more interested in playing, jumping on the lionesses, grabbing them, practicing their own hunting techniques. And as a result, the lionesses had a very unsuccessful hunt. And the same applies to our leopards, but even more so, because they are all on their own. They're solitary mothers. And so their work is seriously cut out for them. Now, the last time Karula entrusted her cubs to Juma and disappeared off, she left them for two days in the same place which obviously she might have come back and visited them at some point but as far as we could tell they were all alone for the best part of the 48 hour period before she went back to fetch them and that's because as with all of our big cats most of their hunting attempts are relatively unsuccessful and the thing that Karula would be oh come on Stienbuki no, Steenbok gone, racing away. I'm about to say the thing that our female leopards love to hunt are little Steenbok and Dacre, tiny little antelope, perfect size for a leopard of Karula's size and strength. Although it is definitely not side outside of her capabilities, and she has done it recently, to catch and to kill adult impala. Go away bird is just half-heartedly calling. I don't think he's got anything. Stienbock, that Stienbock was particularly nervous. I wonder whether or not Karula's been in this area. She was definitely this morning. She crossed just here. Let's make extra specially sure that she hasn't come back. doesn't appear to be the case, at least here. All right, and 
think what I'll do now is travel all the way along the southern boundary and make my way to Cheetah Plains and do a quick search there, find out what's happening before heading back to Juma as it starts to get dark and a bit cooler. Because on a hot day like today, almost everything is going to be sleeping. Except for leopards. Leopards are, leopards are an enigma. They don't necessarily follow the rule book and you, we found Tingana before moving about on boiling hot days. You can find a leopard pretty much at any time of day. And Chris Rogue, absolutely yes. I, fed, I said I heard Tingana last night. I assume it was him. Yeah, very clear leopard rasping call at about 2 o'clock this morning. I don't think it's him. And the reason why I say that is Tingana's tracks are noticeably bigger. Tingana does have really, really big feet. Feet that are almost, I mean, I compared my palm to them. They were just, just over the size of my palm. Tingana's tracks come right up to the middle of my fingers when I rest my hand against his track. So I don't think it was him. That being said, I'm, there's definitely a chance that the leopard that Steph was tracking this morning is Tingana. Mike found tracks coming in from Torchwood around Biffles Hook Dam. But with all of those lions around, there's a chance that Tingana's playing a little bit hard to get. And then, of course, there's the leopard that was seen in Biffles Hook that Steph was checking for at Sydney's Dam. And the leopard that was seen in Biffles Hook was a big male. It might be Tingana. Although he doesn't often venture that far north, but it could be him. Or, it, or it's Mvula, actually. There's a chance, because when we saw Mvula, he was right on the Biffles Hook boundary, so our northern boundary. Yes, I definitely heard Tingana, well, I think I heard Tingana last night. I heard a male leopard rasping, and it's most likely him. Especially since he was on Torchwood at the end of the sunset safari. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, though on a very, very sleepless night, thanks to the elephant visitor that we had come to stay during the evening. There's some very relaxed looking impala here. They don't look as though they've got a care in the world, apart from having a look at us. Still on the southern side of our boundary, nibbling away at whatever shoots they can find. I mean, it's quite clear, it must be clear to all of you. I know Steph was talking about October and how miserable October is as a time to be out in the bush. Not miserable, but it's not fun. And these animals are going to be all be struggling to survive. I've noticed quite a few male impala now that they've come out of the rutting season. Now the rutting season they don't eat, they just fight, especially when they've collected a harem. And they end up losing probably about 5% of their body mass during that time, particularly the big adult males like the one that you're looking at now. And I've noticed quite a few of them really struggling to recover from that particular time. Just because even though during our dry season there's always a lack of nutrients in the plants, it is particularly pronounced this year. nibbling away at whatever they can find. And you have to admire the digestive system that is able to utilize what little nutrients are left. I mean, you look at what he's eating. It's essentially dry leaves. I know it's hard to see, but it's hard to imagine that their, that their digestive system is able to make the most of that. It's actually quite incredible when you think about it. And that, of course, is what made what has made ruminants so successful that for chambered stomach, or four separate stomachs, is a way of ensuring that each and every single bite is as digested or digested as carefully and as thoroughly as possible. <laughs> Shame. Struggling to get there, having to close his eyes. <laughs> That's awesome.
awesome. <laughs> Kirsty Morris has said that her grandson saw the Impala and started to sing Jingle Bells. <laughs> That's brilliant. Our equivalent of reindeer out here in the African bush. Not quite, um, but very, very, very perceptive. I've got to find some more for him so that he can continue to sing his Christmas songs. Perhaps Rudolph is next. I need to find an impala that is equally as perhaps Nelson, our one-horned, one-eyed impala. Perhaps Nelson could be our, the equivalent of our Rudolph. <laughs> It's very sweet. Uh, Impala have moved off further into Little Gowrie, so we shall carry on. Perhaps we'll search for a different large herd for Kirsty's granddaughter. I mean, grandson. All the animals are playing hide and seek at the moment. another spot that Karula likes to cross on but there is no sign of her coming back here it's amazing how oh hello how regular the patterns of Karula's movements have become since she's had cubs not that you could ever describe Karula as regular I wondered what the Oxpeckers were chirping at. There's some female kudu in the youngster. Here we go. Isn't that beautiful? I know that you have spent quite a bit of time with kudu with Steph already. You can hear the harsh cries. If you listen carefully, listen for the harsh cries of the oxpeckers. Oh, of course they went quiet as I said that. There we go. Not a pretty cry. I'm not sure if you can hear it, that bzzzed, bzzzed sound. And those birds are incredibly important when you are walking and listening in the bush. Because not only do they sit on harmless things like kudu, but they will also be around buffalo and other dangerous big animals. And they, more than once, the sound of a buzzing oxpecker has alerted me to the presence of an animal long before my eyes have been able to pick out exactly where it is. Let me go forward and see if I can't find you one, so that we can actually see the bird that's making the call. And it becomes one of those things that you become incredibly attuned to listening for. There must be some in here somewhere. I can hear them chirping away frantically. There's actually so many kudu in here. We just can't see them all. They're quite hidden behind the vegetation. But as Steph was saying, you always find female together in a group. And then you've got these little long-legged, slightly gangly youngsters. <laughs> yes, I'm talking to you. With your oversized ears. Little one's ears look even bigger than the adults do. They have to grow into them. Like that baby steenbok that we saw at Cheetah Plains recently. Okay, let's move on since you have spent quite a bit of time with Kudu with Steph and just double check along the southern boundary once, well, but thoroughly and a little bit further to the east and then we'll start making our way to Cheetah Plains. I haven't heard any updates, but yesterday morning we just narrowly missed the Cheetah as they crossed south into Malamala. I'm hoping 
The logic behind my return there towards the evening will be that they are wandering back across in our direction. Been a long time since we've seen Cheetah. It's time, I feel, to break that particular streak since we've been so lucky with so many other things. Oh. There's a bird. Sorry. Hold on one moment. I think there's a bird imitating a human whistle. That's really interesting. Probably something like a drongo or a scrub robin. Oh, don't stop. I can't see it, but you very seldom can. But just listen to that. changed what it was whistling. Earlier on it sounded like it was imitating a tracker's whistle. Listen to trying to get the notes right. Now that's almost certainly a scrub robin. I'm trying to work out what it's imitating now. It's changed what it was doing when I first heard it. Searching for the right notes. Might be imitating a bushwhack or something similar, or perhaps an oriole. I'm almost certain that's a white brown scrub robin. I'm looking frantically for it. But they're such difficult to spot birds, especially at this time of year where they blend in so perfectly. Let me take my earpiece out for one moment. No, it's definitely here somewhere. Am I going crazy? No, it's definitely here. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Really clever little mimics. Now, one of the amazing things that the scrub robins learn to do, and they won't be doing it now because it's the wrong time of year, but scrub robins are one of the birds that falls victim falls victim to brood parasitism. In other words, cuckoos, cuckoo species target the white-browed scrub and nests. They lay their eggs there and the white-browed scrub robins end up raising their chicks. I'm just taking one more look, but I don't think we're going to spot it from here. I think it's actually quite far in. So how is this for ingenious solution? As our white-browed scrub, scrub robin chirps away. So what they've learned to do is imitate the call of a male cuckoo and it's species specific so it's, it's specific to the types of cuckoos that, that parasitize their nests. Not all of them. Not all of them will target certain species which makes sense. Okay, I'm going to switch on and move off as I describe this. But essentially cuckoos, specific species of cuckoo target specific species of birds and in this kind of arms race between the two species. The white-browed scrub robins have learned to imitate a cuckoo call in order to intimidate other cuckoos in the area to stop them from coming in. Basically trying to do the loudest possible cuckoo sound that they can make, pretending to, that there is one enormous cuckoo in that place and therefore preventing the other cuckoos from moving into that area and laying their eggs in their nest. Amazing. And the textbook that I read that in describes it as an arms race between the cuckoos on the one hand and the poor birds that end up raising their chicks on the other. And that's one of the ways that they have learned to defend themselves against cuckoo parasites. The other thing that they will do is they will viciously band together and mob the cuckoo.
and Kimber Lion on the subject of our various bird species. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. You're wondering which bird species has the highest population density in our area. I'm just trying to think about the answer to that because of course as you will know the red-billed quelia is one of the most new it's the most numerous bird species in Africa. We don't see that many red-billed quelia here. We might get flocks of them blowing over every now and again, but it's a tiny little bird sort of similar to the weavers that Steph was showing you earlier on in the sunset safari. But I think in this specific area, you'll probably find that something like a, a hornbill or a grey go away bird might have very, has very high population densities. But then we've also got all of the little birds that we hardly ever see, and I don't know exactly how many of those we have. It's just because the things like the hornbills and the, the drongos and the go-away birds, they're the ones that are the most prominent, the ones that we see the most often. And black crows? No, we don't. In terms of our bird species, we do have parrots, but we do not get the African grey. The African grey is more towards the rainforests and the jungle areas of Central Africa. It's not a bird species that naturally occurs here. There are a couple of feral populations in the big cities from birds that have escaped from aviaries. But no, no African grey parrots in this particular area. We've only got much smaller species, brown, head, brown hooded sorry, brown-headed parrots, mayor's parrots, and grey-headed parrots, not carrots, oh goodness. <coughs> much, much smaller, almost parakeet-like little birds. But our long-lived African greys are not from our part of the world. And in fact, they're more up towards where Brent is as we speak, which is of course very, very exciting. He's going in, he is in Rwanda, he sent me a message to say that they had landed safely there a couple of hours ago and I think he is beside himself with excitement for what is to come. The first ever live filming of gorillas. Now Charlie, you want to know in terms of our question about Brent and his trip to Rwanda, this incredibly exciting opportunity. You're wondering if it is going to be on the sunrise or the sunset safari tomorrow. It is going to be on the sunrise safari. That is when Brent will be out and about. They'll start their exhibition. No man, not exhibition. That's not what I mean at all. Expedition. Goodness. Their expedition will start f sort of halfway through our sunrise safari where they will we'll get to see, I think, a little bit of their trek up the mountain. This is all, of course, depending on how things go. And then hopefully they will find the gorillas relatively quickly and we'll have it towards the end of the sun, sunrise safari tomorrow. But we shall have to wait and see. Okay, we better find you something on the crest of this hill otherwise we will disappear into the depths of the Mulwanini and you'll lose us. But where are all the elephants? I was, that was another thing of my thinking of going to Cheetah Plains. Because it's been such a hot day, I'm hoping that there's going to be hordes of elephants streaming in from the Kruger National Park to come for a drink there. Okay, so we can go racing off towards Cheetah Plains before it cools down too much. While we head across there, let's go back across to Steph and find out how his lion tracking mission has gone. Well, welcome back to our car. And for those of you who are just joining me, my name's Steph. And I'm slowly starting to piece together the puzzle that was the lions this morning. Right in this area yesterday, there was a male with quite a big scar on his lip that was mating with a female lioness. This morning, coming out of the area where they were mating was a male and a female. The male split. We found the male at Chelepan, which is about two miles from where we are now. The female split off and went to Biffleshook Dam to a sister of hers that has some cubs. 
What about the mating pair? I thought this morning, and mistakenly so, that the male that we were looking at was the male from the mating pair that came from the same area. It was a male and a female track. The track splits. He carried on going south into Bivazuk. But when I saw a photograph of him, I never saw that distinctive scar that he's got on his lip. And so the pieces of the puzzle that were missing, just for me, seem to have fallen into place. We've been looking for the reason that there's so little gay movement around Sydney's pan this afternoon, and I think I may have pieced it together. Let me show you quickly what we have. We're now about, about five or six hundred yards from, from Sydney's pan. And right here is the track of a lioness. Here. Can you see that one there? Yep. And this one here? Oh, not really. Right, this is the track of a lioness, and this is quite a fresh track heading towards the dam. Now, what I'm actually thinking is I've actually just spent the last 10 minutes or so on foot tracking, backtracking the lions that we found this morning. They walked straight through the area where I think this lioness was lying yesterday. And I think what happened is this lioness and this male have gotten up from where they were, where they were mating behind us and walked towards Sydney's dam for a drink. There... They met some more pride members, another male and a female, that walked back along their tracks, back. It just so happened to be along the vector that they were at, one going towards Biffleswick Dam, which is in that direction, one going south towards Hoffman's where his brother was, that's in that direction, and they just happened to split. So I think that that mating pair are still together. I also think that they are just off of our concession in Hook, and I think that they are lying up with each other around Bivelswick Dam, and that's why we're seeing so little animal movement around Sydney's. That's anyway, that's my story, that's what I'm going to stick to. It's a very, not a very fresh track, but it's definitely from this morning. I think that that's exactly what's happened. Male and female mating pairs, they don't, they don't actually move around that much. When they're mating with one another, it's not uncommon for them to go and join the rest of their pride mates, but generally they look for a place of seclusion, they look for a place on their own. And that's exactly what I think is happening here. They came for a drink, they met up with some of their pride mates, their pride mates just happened to walk straight through the area that they were in the previous day, thereby confusing me and confusing the tracks and everything going on. Yes. More so, I'm sticking to that. Here's the tracks of the male. So there was the female. Let's see if I can show you the track of the male. Substantially bigger. There's his track there. Uh, here we go. That's a male lion's track. It's exactly what you're looking at there. And that is where he walked off. So they walked off together and they walked off towards Sydney's. And that's why we haven't got lots of animals around Sydney's. Anyway, what I'm going to do is let's go and see if we can't pick up any sign of these two wanderers. It's getting to that time of the day. The sun is starting to set. And it's actually taking the temperature with it. It's actually quite astounding. It's dropping. It's now where it was probably, well, it was 86 when we started the game drive. I'd say it's probably in the mid-70s, if not 70 degrees now, and dropping literally by the minute. And after sunset, it'll get cool enough for us to want to put jackets and jerseys on again. Amazing, huh? just putting all these pieces together. It's been a day for that, I must be honest with you. Lots of activity around the last couple of days. Now we've got animals moving around and moving from where they were static on kills and static mating with one another and sort of sedentary around babies and they're starting to move out and they're leaving tracks of their passage around and it's left up, up to us to sort of unfathom and unravel and see if we can show it to you. Just another indication that we're doing this all live. It's nothing scripted. We go out in the afternoons basically knowing about as much as what you do with a couple of hints here and there. We sometimes have trackers and we sometimes have other game rangers giving us their opinion on what is around and what's going on.
and that helps us definitely. And then there's a lot of staff that move around during the middle of the day and are able to give us updates, of course, as to what they saw during the day. But it, it comes in in drips and drabs, and to be honest, we literally get into the vehicles with you in the afternoon, 10 minutes or so before, and when we say hello, we know about as much as what you do about what's going on. All right, I think this is going to be the last time that we check this pan today. I think I've done this block around this dam probably six or seven times already today. Every time you see something slightly different, let's see what's here, and nothing. <laughs> Just makes me believe that we have got something lying up here. <laughs> Not much at all. I am going to take a little bit of time though to just scan with my binoculars. Quite often something will be lying in the open that you, you miss here. Dismissing it as a figment of your imagination. But I see nothing. You see anything Dave? No. <laughs> All right. And based on that, I think we go into a different area. Ah, I've got a question on that pot I found, and it's difficult to hear you, but I think it's from NH NATO. Um, we have got no more information on the pot I found. I had a brief meeting with the owner of, the, of Juma Game Reserve, Yuri Moorman, um, last week on Wednesday. And um, he is so busy at the moment, he's really finding it difficult even to spare 20 minutes of his time on this particular property at this time of the year. He said to me, please just hold on, he will get to it, and he will see me in the next couple of weeks or so. But he didn't give me a date, but as soon as I know, I absolutely will let, let you know all about it, probably trying to share it in one of these short stories that we like to do so much, or we'll just go there on a walk and do it while we're on a walk with you. But right now, no more news, so it stays. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, during the Father's Day shows a couple of weeks back, I found a pot, a clay pot in a termite mound. Its origins unknown. It could be a burial pot, in other words, it could be an appeasement to the ancestors of the family that lives in this particular area, or it could be a treasure pot. One of the two, we have yet to determine which one. The only way that we're really going to do that is to take members of the family that have hereditary right on this particular piece of land to that clay pot and see if they acknowledge it as a burial pot, as an ancestral pot. In that case, we're not going to be touching it, it needs to stay there. But if they don't acknowledge it as a burial pot, then they will decide with the landowner what's going to be happening to that clay pot. Do we leave it in situ or do we excavate it and see what's inside? So it's all a bit of a mystery at the moment, to be quite honest. But one that's really kept us going for a number of weeks. We were speaking about it literally two days ago around the dinner table. Really quite interesting, I must be honest. We've got a question coming through from, I think, someone gorilla at the moment. My comms are a bit scratchy at the moment, but anyway, I'll answer it. What's Kasi, you think? So, what is the largest termite mound that I found, and how long do I think it's been growing there for? Well, that's a source of much debate, to be honest, as well. The largest termite mound that I think that I found is on Cheetah Plains, on the access road into Cheetah Plains. There's an absolutely giant termite mound that's there just at the entrance to Cheetah Plains. Um, quite easily the tallest, biggest one that I've seen. There's a couple more out here that are definitely bigger in terms of width, but none that are wide and as high as what this particular one is. And then there are a couple out here that have trees growing on them. Not that the termite mound has grown around the tree. Literally the tree is growing on the termite mound. And these trees are anywhere up to six or seven hundred years old. So at least six or seven hundred years for some of these big termite mounds. And what's even more mind-blowing for me is to decide whether or not 
These termite mounds are one single family that's just had a succession of just different queens over the last seven or eight hundred years, or does a colony die and then it's repopulated by a different colony and then grows a little bit bigger and then grows a little bit bigger again? I don't think I've ever read the answer to that particular question. And why don't I pitch it at our audience right now? One of those things that we can't do out here is know everything. And it's so exciting to get your feedback and your help in basically unraveling a mystery like this. So I pitch a question to all of you out there. What do you think or what can you find that lends some evidence to either a termite mound having a succession of, same, of the same family basically through the ages or is it a colony that dies down and is repopulated and dies down and is repopulated? You don't have to give your answer right now. You can give it to me later on in the day, tomorrow, next week, whenever. Send it through via email if you want to questions at wildearth.tv and I'll read out or if I can memorize them, I'll memorize some of the better ones for us to go and do on, on one of the shows here. And we have some arrow marked babblers. I'm not a bird that is easy to identify just by looking at it. They're rather drab brown and only when you really get close to them do they have this white chevron on their chest but their noise that they make is distinctive. They've got this babbling noise and the fact that they are gregarious yes that is one there a couple here probably about 10 or 12 or so 258 I'm going to show you in my book once they Dave's doing a fantastic job in really difficult light to try and keep his eye on them but that is the bird that we're looking at this one here the arrow marked babbler and it gets its name from those arrow marked chevrons all over their chest. You can see a pretty drab brown bird, very gregarious, likes the drier areas around here. And one of the more common of the brown birds that we find here. When you get up close and it's in the breeding season, you really get to see that, that eye. And they can sometimes in camps get very used to people and you can get that yellow orange eye. It doesn't look that bold in the book here, but definitely is a really bold color when you see them up close. One of those distinctive bush felt birds. All right. And on that note, oh, and Hannah has just wanted to know if there are any parrots out here. Hannah, yes, we've got a parrot out here. We've got the brown-headed parrot and I'll just show you that quickly on page 66 one of my favorite birds I absolutely love the parrots and you find them all over I've traveled Africa top to bottom at least all the way up to East Africa looking for specific parrots this is the parrot that we find here the brown-headed parrot the most common of the parrots that we find here and a little bit above where we are right now, right on the Limpopo River, we start, the brown-headed parrot starts making way for the mayor's parrot. The mayor's parrot. And then as you go further into, Zim, into Zimbabwe and into Zambia, you start finding the grey-headed parrot, a little bit larger now than these two. And then for some reason the parrots change and they become lovebirds. And we find these lovely rosy faced lovebirds that start to inundate the bush felt. That's in about Zimbabwe, Zambia. You get the black cheeked lovebird, a bird that only occurs on the Zambezi River right at Victoria Falls. You have to go to Victoria Falls just to see this parrot. And then I think if we turn the page, no, there's no more. Just that rosy, rosy faced lovebird and then this black cheeked. All right, and on that note, I'm going to send you back to Jamie. Enjoy. Perfect timing. You have arrived as I have arrived 
at three in a row three in a row pan which is now one mud wallow one dry pan and two mud wallows in a row two mud wallows in a row the three in a row pan name is continuing to change as cheetah plains alternates between water sources out here and the reason that they're doing that is so that they reduce the impact a little bit on an area around the water source because they, this is basically the only water source in this area a little bit added in coral and then there is the the two pumped pans in this area shame and this poor chap here has obviously had to go wading into the pan itself in order to get himself a drink hello boy time's a little bit tough We've got exciting news because it looks as though there are tracks for Shumbambalana coming into this area. So we're going to be checking extra carefully for him. A leopard that I have never seen before who is dominant in this area. But that's what we're going to be looking for. But for the moment we have a zebra with socks on. Shame and he's still thirsty. And that's obviously where the socks have come from trying to get through to the water. Shame boy. There's some water at Cheetah Plains Pan. Go that way. Go that way. This isn't going to be very nice for you. Hm. These sightings become more and more heartbreaking. Looks like he's trying to decide what to do. And I've spoken before about the fact that the animals can actually get bogged down in mud like this. Now, it's unlikely to happen to a zebra. He's big enough and strong enough to move through without any... Not to, he will have difficulty, but he's unlikely to get stuck. But for things that are slightly lighter in weight with sharp hooves, like impala, and have much higher center of gravity than warthog, becomes very very tricky. It's okay boy, we're just watching you. Don't worry. Beautiful stallion in his prime at upright posture and still in very very good condition despite the fact that there's very little grass for these animals to eat. So picturesque, hippo, uh, zebra. Shame, boy. You must go, go east. Go east, there's water there. I also bumped into Mike, who said that the elephants are repeatedly trying to dig up their water pipes that pump the water in this direction. That's because elephants are oh, shame, boy. That doesn't look very nice at all. rubbing the mud off his nose <laughs> that he managed to acquire. Not successful. And he's decided not worth the amount of mud he'll have in his mouth. He's given that up as a bad job. I wonder if he's going to try... No. I was going to say, maybe he'll try at the other pan, but I think he's just decided he's going to move on and back towards Cheetah Plains pan. <laughs> and Safari Dean has said that with our zebra stockings, Perhaps he is doing the best, his best, Nyala impression. The Nyala bulls, of course, have those glorious stockings up to their sort of the middle of their legs. And our zebra, you're absolutely right. Our zebra has done a very good impression of that. Or attempting. Maybe he thinks he's an Nyala. Uh, maybe he might be going towards the other pan. And he might actually have more success there. It's just reposition, so we can watch him as he goes to drink. I do want to see that he does actually manage. 
after all of this time. Let's just wait to see what he does. He's moving in a very circumspect way around the outskirts of the pan. Pays to be exceptionally careful around water points like this. He doesn't know what's lurking around. A breeze is starting to pick up and he wants to make sure that his approach is a safe one and that there's nothing waiting to ambush him as he goes to go and drink. It's okay, boy. All looks fine here. Yeah. I'm not sure he is willing to take that risk. Slowly but surely, constantly alert. He is on his own, so he doesn't even have the advantage or the safety in numbers that a zebra in a herd does which will mean that he is even more nervous because as soon as he bends his head down to drink he knows that he's going to be vulnerable and in fact I think he's given up on it. Decided that it's not really worth the risk. Okay, let's move on. I don't want it to get to too late before we head to the Cheetah Plains open area. We might even be able to get a view of the sun as it goes down, and that's such a perfect spot to go and watch the sunset. And, of course, look for Shimbambalana. Now, unfortunately, my Cheetah Plains radio has stopped working. So we'll have to fly, we'll have to be driving a little bit blind at the moment, trying to see if we can't figure out where everything is. Luckily, I bumped into Mike, so he was able to pass on that update. And Aqua, yes, as far as I know, well, I mean, look, there's, there's 53 different African countries. I'm not familiar with all of them, but as far as I know, most of them, at least in the southern hemisphere, we do drive on the left-hand side of the road. I'd find it now with years and years of habit driving a stick shift or a manual car with, on this side. I think I would find it incredibly confusing to have to swap around. So I've actually never driven in a place where they drive on the right-hand side of the road. I think there might be some countries up towards North Africa that might drive on the right, but for the most part it is a, at the Southern Africa definitely left-hand side of the road. I would find it infinitely confusing to have to swap around. When I went, recently went back to the UK, I accidentally found myself driving through central, central London. I got lost. That is not somewhere you want to find yourself, even if it is on the left-hand side of the road. It was nearly disastrous. It was utterly, ter utterly the, by far the most terrifying driving experience I've ever had, driving through central London. going to do a quick check of the open area and then make our way further north towards the Encoral boundary. I know Mike is checking up in that region, although he'll have to communicate through smoke signals in order to tell me if he's found anything.
Okay. We're oh, coming up to Cheat Plains Pan, which is pumped. Of course, everybody's exceptionally excited about Brent's trip to Rwanda in order to film the live gorillas. Now, one thing that he joked about before he left was the fact that he's going to drive Graham mad because he's going to want to stop for each and every single bird. And we always encourage, to keep, encourage our viewers to keep a bird list, keep track of all of the different birds that they see on the live safaris. Cindy, I don't think it would be illegal to count the ones that Brent sees and you could just start your own list or a, a new list birds of wonder and there's so many amazing things that you could see there I know Brent was looking for really really excited to see species that he has never seen before now you may, you may find in typical Brent fashion that he becomes incredibly distracted in the middle of whatever he's doing and Gra Graham will be shouting at him to get back to looking for gorillas as he attempts to figure out which particular bird is hopping from tree to tree oh so so exciting all right here comes cheetah plains pan Uh, the trip up to Rwanda on that subject is a three-man mission, Graham, Emily and Brent. So Susie, Graham apparently is going to be acting as Brent's cameraman, which could in turn be very, very interesting. I'm not sure exactly what the plans are. I'm actually kind of jealous of all of you watching this particular safari because I'm going to be out in the vehicle and I really want to watch what's happening. Oh, I'm a little bit jealous. I'm sure that you're all going to have a marvelous time. Well, the beautiful open area is utterly devoid of life, apart from some turtle doves. At least you know that there is a pan full of water for the animals to drink. But other than that, all is quiet too quiet. Why is it so quiet today? What don't we know? Perhaps the strange warm weather that we've been having. Nope. It's the slowly setting sun. All right. I'm going to carry on towards the Mala Mala boundary quickly, figure out what is happening there. And while we do that, traveling on along a road called Shkankanka Road, somewhat hopefully, in other words, Cheetah Road, Let's find out how Steph is doing with his search, very determined search for those lions. <laughs> uh, yes, is all I can say to that. <laughs> and uh, you've actually just got us a little bit before we are about to pull into the den site of the lioness around Bifosok Dam. Now, I've never been to this den site before. I also haven't seen these lion cubs before, and I'm looking forward to it, to be honest. I don't quite know where it is. I'm relying on Dave to point out to me exactly where it is. I see a little bit of a road going in here, and I think that's exactly what we're going to take. Let's get our car into ultra creep mode. Not the bad type. I'm talking about the motion type. And let's go and see if we can if this lioness is there and if we can see her cubs. I'm actually quite excited. I quite enjoy lion cubs. Watching lions sleep is not one of my favorite pastimes, I'll be honest with you. But lion cubs are very rarely unconscious. I must be honest, on the way down here, I have very rarely seen so much lion activity as I have on this property at the moment. And it's because these mothers with these cubs are walking up and down to their sisters. They are 
walking backwards and forwards from water and feeding sites and food and kills and back to their cubs to give milk. And they're doing that throughout the whole day. They're not that temperature dependent. When it comes down to that, watch out here, Dave. Watch out, everybody. We're going to go through these sticks. I'm hoping that she's here holding, holding thumbs that she is. I've walked this drainage line so many times thinking it would be terrible to be cornered by a lioness in here. It's quite deep, big game path. It's actually quite amazing that she's been right here on this little isthmus. see there's almost a car park here where the cars have gone around in a circle around and have a look here I'm gathering the dens in the deeper side Dave is just telling me that there's a fallen jackalberry and she's underneath the fallen jackalberry I don't know why I have this almost need to want to talk softly and whisper because the car is still making the same noise as it always does Quite exciting, I must be honest. I'm looking forward to seeing. See if we can go in here and see. I see the fallen jackalberry, that's that tree there. What I don't want to do is startle her. Ah, I've got her. Alright. She's lying on top of a termite mound. I don't know if that is the lioness with the cubs. She's very alert. It looks like something may be around here. Ah, I can see a tail. Is that is that a baby? Yes? No? Let's see. It is. Ah, lion cubs, I got them. <laughs> Alright, let's see if we can get a little bit closer now that I know where they are. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to keep our eyes on her. And obviously what we don't want to do is disturb her at all. So I'm going to keep my eyes on her, making sure that I react instantaneously to anything that she tells me. And I'm looking predominantly at her ears. You can see her ears are cocked forward. She's not worried about us whatsoever. I'm looking at the babies. They're not scrambling away. We're taking our time, taking our time. It's exactly what we want to do is we just want to give her the benefit of the doubt. You can see her ears are cocked not at us. And the babies are not scrambling away. One tiny little baby just stuck his head into the grass, but you can see that female ears are still pointed far away from us. She hasn't even turned her head in our direction. Look at that. What a perfect den sight. Amazing. Now because mother lions have such short gestation periods, literally just 110 days or so, they do have to give birth to more than one baby, give birth to more than one baby, because giving birth to babies that are not able to really fend for themselves is a risky thing for a lion who has to eat and catch food. So she gives birth to more than one baby at a time, anywhere up to about six she then stashes them in these hidey holes and will move the den site every couple of days or so. I see that this particular den site has been used for some time now. There's a variable ocean of roads around here. Oh, she's beautiful. Lovely condition. And she's picked such a nice spot. 
keeping, you can see that that alertness that she had when we came in here has relaxed slightly. She's flicking her ears again at the flies, which she wasn't doing when I first came here. And it gives me shivers down my spine. I've walked through this very crossing where we're standing here probably 10 or 20 times when I've been in this area. And to know that there's a lioness with her cubs right here. Ooh, a fearsome en enemy is a lioness defending her cubs. You absolutely do not want to get on the wrong side of her. I was once charged by a lioness that had cubs hidden in a thicket. She couldn't move away. And because I was so close to her, she couldn't let me move because ah, she's just gotten up. Big stretch. See that she's still heavy with milk. Have a look at those mammary glands in her tummy. And she will suckle the babies until about nine months. She's moving off. I have no doubt that whatever was catching her attention. She's going to go and investigate whatever it is. She's left the cubs alone on this particular mound. And what that's going to do, we're going to have a look at these cubs for another couple of minutes. Let's just have a look at them. And then we are going to move out. We do not stay around den sites without mommy's present. And because she's left, we will have to leave. And the reason for that is just simple courtesy. These cubs will be ultra high alert at the moment. And we absolutely don't want to overstay our welcome. So we're just going to have a look at this little cub watching his mom disappear. And then what we're going to do is take our leave and go and follow her really. She looks like she could do with a meal. And there that cub's now going into the grass there hiding away. And that's my cue. So we're going to leave. I'm just so happy for that. And while we make our way out of here, Jamie's found a beautiful place to sit and watch the sunset. We'll catch up hopefully with that lioness in a little bit. We have indeed found a beautiful spot to watch the sunset and just enjoy a peaceful moment and a very quiet African evening. Let's just sit and watch the sun dip below the horizon in silence for a few moments. Stunning. Look at that haze layer that the sun is disappearing behind. It does almost look like Jupiter. It looks otherworldly, which I suppose is exactly what it is. It is otherworldly. It does. It looks like a planet, like I imagine planets to look.
incredible. No, I feel invested in the sunset. We have to watch it all the way to the end. Also gives us a lovely chance to just listen for any alarm calls or anything that might tell us where the animals are hiding. amazing do those trees look? They look like veins across the surface of the sun. As we watch the sun dip below the horizon, Theodore is wondering why I'm whispering and am I a bit afraid I'm going to scare the sun away. Theodore, I think I just have. I think the sheer sound of my voice is just terrified of the sun below the horizon. <laughs> Good point. I just thought it was slightly atmospheric. Going, 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 gone. Awesome. So, as the Earth slowly tilts away from the sun, or rotates away from the sun, it means for us that all kinds of wonderful things are going to be coming out to play. I'm going to go and check Buffalo Pan. First of all, because I think that is where I found the brown hyena tracks that I saw a couple of days ago. While we do that, Steph has got a lioness on the move. Isn't that a most beautiful blood red sun? And not only do we have this fantastic sun to watch, we also have those lions. Now we now know that that lioness with the cubs wasn't alone. She has her two sisters with her. I've seen at least three lionesses here. And so the nice thing is is that her sisters have come back to her den site and will help her hunt tonight. And I think that all the lion tracks that we've been seeing around Juma today are these lions. I think even one, even the lioness that was being, well, not really, no, sorry, let me retract that. I think the lioness that's being mated with is still at Bilhuzuk Dam, uh, at Sydney's Dam, and these are the rest of the pride. Getting ready for a night hunting. She's just probably woken up. And true to form, True to form, these lions are not very, very far away from Buffalzook Dam at all. Here, here's another lioness. So we've had four lions actually. Natasha's just wanted to know how the cubs know 
that the mother doesn't, I think the mother doesn't want them to join with on the hunt or how do they know when she's back? Tasha, it's, it's as, as far as I can ascertain after all the cubs I've seen, it's a body language thing. The, the mothers just give off a sign that, it, that says to the babies, it's okay to join or you must stay. And they react instinctively to that. This lioness, I think, is going to get up and join her, her sisters. At least four adult lioness, one of whom, or one of which has the tiny cubs that we just saw now. There she goes. That's the mother with the babies. You can see she's quite heavily lactating. You can see those mammary glands on her tummy just in front of her back legs. They are full. <clears throat> so let us go around and see if we can see them. <laughs> All right, how special is this? Huh? Cubs, lioness, blood red sun going down. It feels like I'm driving over the world's biggest puncheringest, punchy, punchy, puncher inducing trees at the moment. I'm waiting just to hear telltale hiss associated to me having driven over a dead zebra wood. Well, the trick is going to be to try and get through here without me feeling like an elephant stampeding through this forest. <coughs> All right, and I think while I do that, I think the best is going to be to send you through to Jamie, who's probably got an update of what's happening on Cheetah Plains. Hello and welcome back on the back of our vehicle and at the mysterious and beautiful buffalo pan I've encountered a mysterious track in the ground and I think it, is this what I think it is? Or has an elephant playing tricks on me? Or oh, hoist ourselves onto the side of the wall here and let me jump out to investigate and Gert will tell me if I need to link back to Steph at any point but I'm going to jump out and see what's happening here because we have a track in the ground that looks like a drag mark. How oh, very interesting. And if we can just investigate. Now there's lots and lots of elephant tracks around and sometimes elephants drag their feet in a way. Hmm. In a way that creates what looks like a drag mark but I don't see any tracks here. The drag mark is very clearly going off. Which way is it going? Going in this direction. I can actually see it's consistent. It doesn't stop. It moves all the way in through here now. It's getting, unfortunately, it's getting very dark. It's getting a little bit too dark to go for a wonder. Hmm. How oh, very curious. Is there something in the jackalberry tree that I'm missing? I talk, the one thing I can't see is any tracks on either side of it that might give me a bit more of a clue as to what was, what's been going on here. I'm looking for something like leopard tracks to indicate what might have made this mark. So what I mean by that is when something, when a leopard makes a kill or a hyena drags something, they obviously can't lift it off the ground completely, so they pull it along like this. And the one thing I can't find is any tracks on the other side to indicate what it might be. I'm just going to go around this side, see if I can't work out where it's come from. Definitely didn't come from too far along here. No, it didn't. It sort of stops. Come along, came along here and across the road. I don't see any signs of any scuffle marks, but the elephants have walked through here. Oh, the 
light has got so tricky to try and work things out. Let's go forward a bit and see if we can't spot something around the other side of this termite, this termite mound. Perhaps we have a leopard with a kill. Wouldn't that be absolutely marvellous for the end of our, oopsie, for the end of our sunset safari. I don't hear any sounds of feeding, which is what would be very useful as a giveaway. It also doesn't look brand spanking new fresh, which is a bit unfortunate. And HKP, you were wondering what I find interesting about drag marks. HKP, I find the end of drag marks interesting. Um, whatever has moved something from one place to another is what I find interesting about drag marks. The conclusion of the drag mark. I'm just going to go a little bit ahead, check for leopard tracks while I do. Let's go back to Steph and see how he's doing keeping up with his line. Definitely, definitely three sisters together here, or sisters or relations at least. They don't necessarily have to be sisters. Could be aunties and mommies as well. And then the lactating female has walked back in the direction of her cubs. I have no doubt that she'll just finish a last feed or two with her babies, tuck them in for the night, so to say, and then come and join her sisters again. for a little nocturnal hunting. At this time of the year, it's not uncommon for lions literally to camp out next to water sources. They know that at some point during a 24 hour day, that animals have to come and drink. And they are literally just being the opportunists that they have evolved to be. Nothing cruel about it. I had a drought in 2000 and... Ooh, I'm now going back a few years. Let me just try and think before I say anything here. It was 2008 or 2009. There was a drought in the Kruger National Park. Not quite as bad as the one we're having right now. And a lion pride camped within sight of a water source and killed something every second or third day to a point where the animals got so used to the lions being there that they used to literally just walk past within feet of the lions feasting on a prey species, go and drink and carry on with their day. It's just this uneasy truce. One sacrifices itself so that the others can live. She, she looks like this lioness has got a bit of a scar going down her flank. I just want to see if it's not just an overpronounced wrinkle or it is actually a scar. No, it's just a wrinkle it looks like. Actually, I don't know so much. Horn and hoof, tooth and claw definitely will give a scar. Ah, and that is a scar that means that this lioness is amber eyes. I know James's favorite. Well, because I am on foot, nine times out of every ten I'm in the bush and never really get close enough to lion to see distinctive characteristics like scars on the flanks. I don't get to know these cats as intimately as what Brent, James and Jamie do. So for me, it's actually about an as new an experience it is for a lot of you who've just joined the show. Oh, big yawn. And back to sleep, which is exactly what lions do. This time of the day, wake up, short exercises, lie on one another, urinate a bit, stretch, yawn, fall back asleep. It's like you lying in the bed on a Sunday morning. They have Sunday every day.
there's a herd of elephant that's approaching. They're busy listening intently into the bush in front of us, and I can hear elephants moving through the bush probably about 500 or so yards away, steadily making their way down to the dam. Elephant will definitely chase lion and are a danger to lion cubs, but not as bad as what buffalo would be. Buffalo definitely would be a, a deathly danger to lion cubs. And hyena, even leopard and wild dog. Here you can see the socializing that is so typical of these cats. That's what strengthens the bonds between one another. And what she's done is she's put herself in the space of her sister. And she's eliciting a grooming response. For those of you who have pets, they do exactly the same thing. They come and put themselves in your space and elicit you to pet and groom them. And you can see there the two arms over one another, the sisters. Comrades in arms. I know that's a bit cheesy. Probably going to get a double apple juice when I get home for that one. Now, a lot can be said for lion prides, to be quite honest, in terms of their social structures. It seems to be relatively deep and um, very complex. Not as complex as what wild dog or hyena social structures are, but definitely not just a collection of related females and males. And just recently, in the last year, we've had such a brilliant show with the Nkuhumas having been taken over by the Birmingham boys, fragmenting, losing some pride members, now being brought back together again under the rule of these Birmingham boys, submitting to their, their mating pressure and bearing babies. We've seen full circle come with these Nkuhumas. It's taken a year. I think when we started to see those Birmingham boys on property last year, I can't remember, I do remember it was quite dry. We saw them for the first time and we saw them mount their offensive against the Matimba males. And we thought to ourselves, is this going to be over quick or is it going to take long? And I think as some of us predicted, it took a full circle, six months to a year for the prides to stabilize in this area again and for babies to be reborn. Compensate for the loss of the adults that they caused. This time of the night it's deadly quiet. All the daytime animals settling into their nighttime resting places, all the nighttime animals starting to only wake up and stretch. It's a time of peace and quiet in the bush. And that quickly transforms. Nocturnal hunters will come out within the next 20 or 30 minutes or so. Water holes stay active this time of the year, 24-7, around the clock. And as you'll note from the variety of different options that we have nowadays to give us angles on all the different watering sources, if you have an eye on many of them in many of the national parks around Africa, they have cameras at the moment on watering holes. And it's a brilliant time of year from now until the middle of November to keep your browsers open on these damn cameras. There are some fantastic sights to be had around these cameras this time of the year, in particular at night time. For those of you unfamiliar with a national park called Itosha, I would probably say that that has the most variety around their watering points that I've ever seen in my life. Tosha National Park, I think have a few cameras around their watering points. Not uncommon to see many, many black rhino, lots of lion.
And of course, every other forgotten water hole and water point in the Kruger National Park has its associated lions and activity as well. Ah. Susan in Florida has asked me a question about planning a safari trip. And Susan, um, it's you coming in winter, you coming in the dry season. Um, what to pack, where to go. That, I don't know, if you're coming to South Africa, the Kruger National Park is always a very safe bet. And for one simple reason is I rate the Kruger National Park as A, the most consistent good game viewing in, in Africa. And B, it is quite comfortable and easy to get around in. It's not rough. You can drive yourself around the Kruger National Park. You can stay warm if you forget jackets. You can, you know, you can, there's swimming pools. You can cool yourself down when it's too hot. And game viewing is generally good winter, summer, day and night. And that's why the Kruger National Park is one of the most spectacular wilderness places left on the planet because of that. You get other game reserves that are more spectacle based, but those are quite seasonal. You have three to four, five months of hot action, and then you don't have a lot of action after that. Botswana is a typical case. There are a few places in Botswana. Just go back to these lines there. Busy getting moving at the moment. And while we're watching them move, I'll finish my, my story. So it all depends on where in Africa you're going to come. Um, South Africa is enormous. Kruger National Park, 400 kilometers from south to north. 180 kilo, 80 kilometers at its skinniest point, wide, so a massive national park. Okavango Delta, many hundreds of thousands of hectare, millions in actual fact. You've got Zambia, South Luangwa Valley in Zambia, Liwa Plains in Zambia. You've got East Africa, the Serengeti, the Masai Mara. All of these parks have their special times and their, their spectacles. One thing I can say after all the years of guiding tourists to these special places is everyone always underestimates how freezing cold a game drive in winter here can get. Definitely bring your ski jacket and many layers. You laugh when I say ski jacket, but you'll definitely thank me if you're coming here in July, August. And there the last lioness goes into the bush. And moving into the bush there. Let's see where they're going. I'm just going to have to ask Rebecca to have a look through there. We've got some lines through that gap in the V. Up a little bit. There we go. They're in there. Ah, Elaine Cole has made an observation. Excuse me, Elaine, I was just having a game drive radio speaking into my ear the same time Rebecca was telling me your question. Um, you've asked that, or you've observed that lions have a relationship with one another, and is this rare? Um, absolutely, lions are the only social cats that we have out here. Um, they're actually the only social cats in the world. It's actually more common for cats to be totally solitary, very similar to how you see leopard with only females and babies really spending much time together and loose associations of males and females whenever they're mating with one another. So definitely the love that you see between these cats is one born of necessity. They are social cats. They are cooperative hunters. They hunt prey many, many times their own body weight. If you think about a buffalo weighing 
1,600, 1,500 pounds, and a female lion only weighing 300 pounds, you can see the big weight discrepancy. They need to trust one another. They need to have this bond with one another so that they can hunt these big animals and they can feed themselves and feed their babies. So yes, it's a type of love. I, I'm loath to use the word strong emotions like love and hate when we're talking about animals like that. You very rarely see such intense emotion with, uh, with these animals. I mean, you see rage, definitely. But in terms of hate or love, difficult one, I've, 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 I'm, I don't like using that when I'm describing, describing animals. But there's definitely a bond there. That is no doubt. You're 100% right in your observation of seeing a very tight-knit bond and what looks to be quite affectionate amongst amongst these lions. Very similar to how your pets at home have a bond with you, you know. Very affectionate, want to be in your company. All right, I'm just going to have to update this sighting quickly. If you would excuse me for two or so seconds. Uh, stations um, still static in the in Kahuma sighting off of Jack's Road is one station in this position, no one on approach. Um, animals are lying about 50 meters or so off of the road on the side of the drainage line. There we go. So I've done my administration for the evening, just updating everybody. All my colleagues, they all have radio systems like we do. They all have their safari plans and they would have spent the sunset having a sundowner somewhere or perhaps with a group of elephant or with some buffalo or at a nice vantage place. And cats are very often a favorite to come and view after the sun has gone down. I must be honest, the Game Drive Radio have been very quiet today. I can only lay it down to the fact that there's not too many Game Drives out. Uncommon for this time of the year. Right, and while we enjoy the last little bits of the sunset and keep an eye on these lions for you, I'm going to send you over to Jamie for an update. Oh, while Steph keeps an eye on the sunset and those lions, we're driving straight in to the setting sun, or the set sun now, going west and back towards home. And it's such a lovely, lovely evening. The colors are stunning. The smells are stunning. It's not freezing cold. It's just a really beautiful night. Makes me worried though, July always does this. July gets warm and makes you think that summer's coming and then it hits you with a revolting cold snap that's, been, that's the coldest it's been all year. So I'm not getting my hopes up just yet that summer's around the corner, but for now, enjoying a little bit of an Indian summer out here in the African bush. And of course this is the perfect time to be out looking for various critters. The small and nocturnal and slightly shyer animals come out to play on a winter's night. The last time I drove this route along Cheetah Plains I spotted a serval, which is a medium-sized cat that kind of looks a little bit like somebody shrunk a cheetah. Not quite, but kind of and is one of the rarer creatures that one could see out on these live safaris or on a real life safari. And we were fortunate enough to actually spend about half an hour with it as it fed. So I went and I checked that spot because serval do have regular pathways that they walk just like our leopards and our lions. Unfortunately the only thing that was there was a very large bull elephant in must. So we left him because it was getting dark. I couldn't quite see exactly where he was. He was perfectly peaceful, don't get me wrong, but he would just I just figured it was a bit more sensible to stay on his good side. Oh, by the way, an update on the... Oh, hold on. I don't think these leopard tracks were here earlier. Hmm. I've lost them now. Do a very careful scan. 
of this area. The leopards love to come past Cheetah Plains Lodge. Hard in this light. Uh, they've gone off the road. Oh, Robin, um, absolutely, that's a very good point in terms of the mark in the, in the sand. You were wondering if it could be an animal with a tail that was perhaps dragging it in the sand. The thing to look for there, and we stopped actually at a Legavan track this morning on our sunrise safari. A Legavan is a type of very large lizard species that we get in South Africa, and we had a look at that. The trick is to look for tracks on either side. Um, so that wasn't a tail track. There's very few animals. Oh, wow. Hold on a second. I'm going to stop so we can look at the sky while I answer this. Move my aerial out of the way. Just look at the colors. Oh, it's beautiful. Actually, quite nice to just sit and listen for the moment. Look at that. Beautiful sunset. So Robin, that didn't look like a tail track to me. There were no tracks on either side. There's also very few animals that drag their tails. Um, and when they do, they leave a slightly deeper indentation than that mark. My suspicion is that it's not fresh. I think it was from yesterday. And I think it was hyenas. The reason I say that is there's tracks there all the time. And also there is a latrine. There's a hyena latrine right next to Buffalo Pan. So it's obviously an area that they spend a lot of time in. Quite possibly a different clan to the ones that we have become so familiar with. Perhaps based in more in the Kruger National Park itself because it's right on the boundary there. And it was definitely a drag mark. There's no question about it. I double triple checked. Absolutely a drag mark. The other thing that you can sometimes get confused with is an ant trail. But that was definitely not an ant trail. None of this, in, in an ant trail, the stones and the sticks don't get moved around in the way they had been in that track. <laughs> James Richard has said perhaps one of our flying leopards that had made the kill. And certainly today has been a one of just one of those days where we, especially this afternoon, have missed out on seeing the spotted cats of the of the Sabi sand. Can't have brilliant days every day, but I know what James is talking about. We'll be tracking, 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 and all of a sudden, leopard tracks are gone, which has led us to the belief that our leopards either have wings or portal systems. I'm still not entirely sure which way it works, or somebody with a stamp for the leopard track stamp, which would be absolutely hilarious. We should definitely get on that. We are going to go through the dip around Cheetah Plains Lodge now to start heading back towards home, which does mean that we might lose our signal as we go through. I've stopped for now. I think those leopard tracks are crossing back towards in Coral, but I'll keep checking along the driveway because there's a chance that he's utilizing that path on his way around. I have no idea which leopard it is. It is probably, a, it is definitely a male. I'm just not entirely sure which one. But while we go through the signal dip, back over to Steph and his lions. I must say, we're also enjoying this lion sunset sighting that we have going. It's such a peacefulness. Let's see if we can find these lions. It's not totally dark, as you can see. Well, I mean, not totally dark, but it is dark. And there, through the gap. Let's see if those lions are actually still there. Are they? Or have they moved off? Let's see if I put some spotlight on them for you. There they are. Now they're lying pretty far. Why? One of the reasons why I haven't gone into the bush over there is that lioness is lying close to there with her cubs. And me crashing around in there in this vehicle is not what I want to do. So those lions, the lioness moved off to her cubs a little bit earlier on. Her sisters followed her. They are lying down in there very relaxed. But one thing I'm not going to do is crash my way onto the side of a drainage line and upset those cubs. And it's a follow on on a question from this morning about habituating these animals to our presence. It's not so much forcing them to conform to our rules 
It's literally us just paying them all the respect and they will tolerate us around them literally for the rest of their lives if we just treat them with a lot of respect. And one of the respects that I pay these lions is when they go into thick bush like this with cubs, I do not follow. We can always come back and look at the cubs tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. The beautiful thing about the Safari Love product is that you can literally come on game drive with us every day for the next, hopefully, years to come. Unlike tourists who come and go very frequently. You can see those lions lying down there. Now what I may suggest is that we actually, now I suppose we can spend the last couple of minutes of this drive right here. They might get up and move towards us. What I suggest then that we do for the last seven minutes of this drive is drive around. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that we're not going to get a better view of these lions from here. So I think let's call it a day. We had a lovely sighting of those cubs, albeit fairly quick. I know to augment all of you, the sightings were lovely for me to see those, those cubs for the first time. Mother left, we left, we joined the sisters for a little bit. As they got going with their day, they sleeping here. I have no doubt they're going to hunt tonight. That lioness that's lactating, she looks like she needs to have a meal. Her, she's got a lot of milk at the moment, but she's looking quite lean. And it's because those cubs are quite hungry. It's, it's quite a lot of energy is used in milk production. And she's going to need to put a lot of that energy back. So holding thumbs for these sisters tonight that they pull something out of the bag. Hopefully they kill something big like a buffalo or a zebra. And those cheeky males don't come and steal it from them. I think for the next couple of minutes of this drive, why don't we take a drive around and see what's approaching this dam. And perhaps what we can do is put a small wager on what we think they're going to kill tonight. And of course I'm being very optimistic by saying that. So, what is this? A stump. I'm just going to have to call in the fact that I'm leaving this particular area, so just give me one second to do the administration. Uh, mobile stations, I'm going to be making my way out of the Inkahuma sighting off of Jack's Road. There's static on the western side of the road, 50 meters uh, down the drainage line, on the bank of the drainage line, on the southern bank, so not visual, about a one out of five visual from the road. All right, so there's my admin done for the evening. <coughs> Excuse me, coughing like that. All right, now let's go and see if we can find something approaching this dam. I definitely have heard some elephant, the elephant in the area, hopefully a little bit closer now than they were. And when we were leaving the den of the lion, we bumped into a herd of zebra that was probably numbered around about 15 individuals. It was quite a large herd of zebra. <laughs> James Richards asked me a nice question. And it's in the, the wording of this particular one that my answer is apparent. You've asked me if I were to spend an entire day with a big cat, lion, leopard, or cheetah, which one would it be? James, it would def definitely be a cheetah, um, only because they are active during the day. And uh, for me to spend time with sleeping leopard and lion, as exciting and as beautiful as what they are, I'd much rather be with an active cat. So definitely if it was the day, it would be a cheetah. At night time, whew, probably, I don't know, I'd have to flip a coin for it to be either lion or leopard. Here's a little baby scrub here. And that also gives us a chance to switch off the car. That obviously the lions will not hunt. A little bit too low. They will chase it. I've seen cubs chase scrub here. Usually the scrub here gets away. Oh, here we go. 
There's an elephant hiding behind a bush, doing a very good job. <laughs> oh, quite amazing. And these are the elephants that I heard very close to those lions and that lion cub. This elephant definitely isn't stalking the scrub here. He's busy devouring this red thorn acacia. Right, and I think on that note, we've just had such a beautiful afternoon. I just want to thank you for myself and Dave. Thank you very much for all your questions and thank you for your support. It's lovely hosting you on Game Drive and sharing our world with you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for all the FC ladies that were feeding us through all your questions and comments. I'm going to be saying goodbye and good night. And I wish you, wherever you are in the world, a happy evening. And we'll see you again for tomorrow morning safari. You're off to Jamie. Very soon we will also be saying our goodbyes and good nights. I have to tell you, it's not often that I'm eager to return back to camp, but tonight, after my sleepless elephant-filled night, sitting watching an elephant bull browse in the, underneath the full moon, I'm definitely starting to feel the need for a very early night tonight. It was too special to pass up that opportunity though, to just sit and watch him without needing any lights, all the lights off, and him bathed in moonlight, munching peacefully away. Chat, I sat and chatted away with, to him. I don't think he understood a word he said, I said. In fact, I think it was probably a bit irritating to him. But we, I felt as though we had a lovely conversation. Perhaps he will be back. I hope not. He's not really meant to be inside the garden. And hopefully the elephants decide to leave our poor trees alone inside the camp. Mostly we're more concerned about the safety of the vehicles. So hopefully they decide not to try and pull all of the branches down upon the various different spots. Oh, we'll have to wait until the sunrise safari to find out whether or not our elephant visited, visitors did in fact return. But for now we have come to the end of our another glorious winter's evening out here in the African bush. Steph's right, it's just been such a beautiful afternoon. So as we come to the end of our sunrise safari, a big thank you to Gert for his wonderful camera work as always and for the pleasure of his company as we head back and wend our long way home. And thank you to Rebecca and Lou in Final Control for keeping us under wraps, or keeping us under control I should say. And most importantly, thank you to all of you watching across the globe. I hope you had a marvellous sunset safari and you're excited about the gorillas, we'll catch up with you tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. Bye-bye, everyone.